stress hormones feel good. I mean, you go on a roller coaster, you feel great, but go on that roller coaster 24 seven for a year and then tell me how you feel after, after that year. You may feel good for a certain time, but over time, it's going to take a toll on the body. And I, don't, I think we could get away with intermittent fasting only if we lived in a, a pretty much stress-free environment. But nowadays, it's like you have stresses coming at you at all fronts, you know, environmental stress of bright lights, of EMFs, of you know, crappy quality water. It's just everywhere. So it's just another, another trash piece of trash to the pile that puts us in this stress state. Hey everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode brought to you by Let's Get Checked. You can save 20% off your purchase by visiting tiylgc.com slash PCOS and using the code PCOS20 at checkout. This episode is also brought to you by Polly the go-to marketplace for women looking to find a virtual hormone health specialist. Right now, you can save $10 on your first poly appointment using the code PCOS Oracle. That's PCOS Oracle, O-R-A-C-L-E. Visit poly.co or visit at poly.co on Instagram today and find the right specialist for you. Now, I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to episode 62 of the Peace Source Oracle podcast. In today's episode, I speak with Nathan Colonna about the effects of stress on the body and the lifestyle and nutritional habits that can reduce stress. Nathan is a holistic personal trainer based out of Washington, D.C., with over 10 years of personal experience dealing with his own health complications, as well as working with clients in person and online. His goal is helping others unlock their body's potential through postural gait cycle performance, trigger point therapy, anti-stress nutrition, supplementation, anti-stress living, and helping others understand the word of God. His focus is to attack both the visible and invisible stresses that lead to everlasting suffering. Nathan understands that stress is the number one culprit for disease and sickness and is rooted in physical, chemical, emotional, and even spiritual sources. He hopes to provide the most effective and truthful information that will provide everlasting results. Hello and welcome to the Peace Oracle podcast, Nathan. It's such an honour to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time out of the day to join me on today's episode. I came across your Instagram page a while ago, learning a lot from the content you've been uploading on your Instagram, your website, and I feel like I wanted to get you on the podcast to talk about stress, which is our topic today, and how to lower stress, what can cause stress, how to lower it, because I feel like stress doesn't just it, it affects everyone everyone is some way or another affected by stress whether it's you know your work your diet your exercise and a lot of the time we don't often know that we are stressed because a lot of people say oh, i'm not stressed but in reality inside their body is going through some kind of chronic long-term stress and stress is a huge driver or uh, root cause of PCOS and hormonal issues so i was excited when we agreed to come on so we can Kind of touch on some of the nutritional diet and lifestyle factors that you touch on in your program with your clients as well so thank you so much for taking the time it's a pleasure to have you on uh, um, before we delve into all that nitty-gritty stuff about stress and how to lower it can you share a bit about your own story or journey how you got into health then then touch on how you work in what way you work with your clients to help them lower their stress and regain their health and just overall thriving life yeah sure thanks thanks again you know for for having me on and allowing me to speak with my experience and the knowledge that i've learned um, over the many years of experimenting and making many mistakes as that's really the best way to learn is continuing to make mistakes and change and, and educate yourself but uh first i got very sick at a young age i was 18 similar to what we were talking about before we got on, you got sick around 18 too. Um, I, I got diagnosed with Lyme disease. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, it, could, it could show itself in many different symptoms, but the symptoms I had at the time was I woke up in my dorm room bed in university and I couldn't move. I, I thought I was paralyzed. And that's a huge symptom is the nervous system gets attacked. And uh, I, thought I, had, I thought I had a stroke 
because the whole left side of my body was completely like paralyzed in a sense. Um, it's called Bell's palsy. And I got taken to the hospital. They did a whole bunch of tests on me for about a week. And then after a week, uh, they finally told me I, w I tested positive for Lyme, but I never found a tick, um, never found a tick bite. Although I was very active, I was always outside, you know, in the woods playing around. So it, it could have possibly been, I didn't know for sure, especially at the time, I didn't really know anything about health. Um, so I just kind of did what the medical field told me to do. And that was to start with antibiotics. So I had a, a pick line put in me in my arm and I shot myself with antibiotics for 26 days. And after that time, I, I didn't make any lifestyle changes in college. I still drank crappy water. I still drank alcohol. I still ate all the food you could imagine. You don't, you don't blink an eye when you're young and, and just living life. So for, for the next, you know, six to seven years, I just, I, I lived a normal life, didn't make any changes. Um, I got into the fitness industry right after college. I was always active as a kid. I played sports, baseball, and golf. And I did, I got into bodybuilding and weightlifting uh, more seriously after college. And then when I, when I was 24, that's when I got sick for the second time with many more symptoms, uh, chronic fatigue, uh, systemic inflammation in all my joints. I just felt very lethargic. I had brain fog. I had constipation. Uh, and I just had this massive migraine for like the whole week. I had to take like a week off of work. And that's where I really uh, started to decide that I needed to do my own research and started to take my health into my own hands. And uh, that's where I met my now business partner at the time where he kind of helped me and influenced me into starting to just simply change the quality of my water and change uh, certain foods I was eating. So from there, I, I changed the quality of my water. At the time I was drinking tap water and then I went to more alkaline water. And now that I know alkalines isn't the, the, the most beneficial, you know, it's been a learning process with that. And then I started changing my diets, doing intermittent fasting, going into a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, a fruitarian diet, carnivore diet, keto diet, um, pretty much a, the Lyme literate diet, uh, so many oil free diets, so many different diets I've tried, you know, over the past uh, four years now of diving into this health field is, is when I started to actually see my health improve. And I never, um, I always lived with the perspective up until that second time I got sick where I thought I had to uh, live with this chronic illness of Lyme disease because that's what I was told. I was told I could never 100% heal. Um, that's all the doctors knew of really. So I had that perspective and it wasn't until I met uh, my business partner now who, uh, his dad had a big influence on him because his dad went through stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and uh, told me kind of it was about the perspective I had to it. And he kind of spark some spark some things to connect in my mind to say, oh, maybe it, it was the specific lifestyle choices I was doing ever since birth up until that time were causing a lot of the symptoms I was uh, that was showing my body was showing me essentially. Interesting. And I, I feel like everyone can relate to the fact that we often think, okay, I'm like you were taking antibiotics. I feel like in the so for women with PCOS, they're obviously given the birth control pill and they say, just take this and then just essentially just carry on with your life. And then when you want to get pregnant, come back to us and we'll, you know, figure out what to do to help you conceive. And I feel like it's, you have to realize that to balance your hormones and like re regain your whole health, you have to take, you have to, there's more components to it. It's not just relying on medication or something some kind of drug it you really have to change your whole lifestyle your, the food you eat your, manage your stress and sleep better and the water you drink just, there's so many variables that i feel people just they just don't know about it because they're not taught about it by their doctor and you end up having to do all this research and that's when you come across all these different diets and you try the different diets and then that doesn't work and causes all these other issues but it's really about making those lifestyle changes and like you said like when you were told that your Lyme disease wasn't you know there was no kind of cure for it and you essentially had to live with it that's always like that kind of 
information you're given that with PCOS you just have to live with it, there's no cure. And in reality, you can live a symptom for your life, you can reverse the symptoms and you know get pregnant, regain your period, all this kind of stuff. And I think it's 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 not right that we are being pushed this idea that you have to take drugs. It's until you, you do experience something that you realise the importance of diet and the food you eat. Let's kind of touch on as we were talking about stress is a driver for a lot of these chronic conditions. What what can be what is stress? What is the different types of stresses that people might not be aware of? Because obviously they always think stress is just stress just comes from studying for an exam or stuck or being stuck in traffic or having a deadline. What are these kind of stresses that people need to be aware of and how does it affect the body? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, we, we get that a lot where people think, oh, I'm not stressed. Um, but then when you look at specific uh, markers of health, like your resting heart rate, your, your temperature, how many times you urinate, your energy, your sleep, those are going to show us otherwise where our body is at currently uh, in, our, in our health journey, wherever we are. Um, so as far as how we perceive stress of what stress is, is um, when our body is not able to perceive a certain event and not able to cope with it properly um, with, with the energy demand needed for that specific situation. Um, essentially with, with how we look at stress is um, there are certain lifestyle habits and factors that put our body into a stress state called the fight or flight state, which I'm sure many of your listeners have heard of, or the sympathetic nervous system state. And there are certain habits that pull us out of that stress state and, and create more of an anti-stressful uh, effect within the body, also known as the parasympathetic state or the rest, the digest, the repair state. Um, and it's simply about that, that balance uh, because most of our whole entire life with me, with I'm, I'm sure you and many listeners is unknowingly and knowingly, we've done these habits that have uh, pushed our body into this fight or flight state unknowingly. And that can come from uh, many areas of stress, whether it's physical stress. So physical can be uh, injuries in your lifetime, surgeries, car accidents, bad posture. Those are physical stresses that can shift your body into this fight or flight state. Then you have the chemical stress, the chemicals in the food, the chemicals in the air, the chemicals in our water, the chemicals in pharmaceutical drugs, um, et cetera, body washes, deodorants, toothpastes, cookware. I mean, the clothes, the list goes on, detergents, the list goes on as far as chemical stress, makeups for females, you know, and then you have emotional stress. So deadlines at work, you know, um, death in the family, breakups, negative work environments. Um, and this is, a, again, accumulating throughout your whole life. And then you have, uh, we really are focusing on now the spiritual stress, uh, the sin, you know, the, the, the disobeying your mom's, you know, cursing, just doing all these spiritual sins that are disobeying uh, God as well, which unfortunately many people don't understand is a stress. So because we all have a soul um, and all these stresses shift our body into this sympathetic fight or flight state. And it just essentially piles up like a big pile of trash. And we're not uh, doing any anti-stressful habits that are getting our body back into this rest, digest, repair state. And with any symptom that we're dealing with, whether it's Lyme disease, whether it's PCOS, whether it's uh, arthritis, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's not having an appetite, uh, whether it's constipation, acne, all of these symptoms that we tend to uh, see is simply our body is in this stress state. Our body has accumulated too many stress responses and not enough anti-stress full habits, um, as well as, you know, we're in this stress state and then we don't have enough energy to keep up with the stress that's continuing to come into our life. Even though we may not feel like we're essentially stressed, these symptoms that we see, whether it's a disease, like I was saying, is, is showing us 
we have elevation of stress hormones and we have a, a deficiency in energy production because in order to have health, we need to produce energy. Um, so that's where checking metabolic markers like your resting heart rate in the morning, your uh, temperature uh, at the same time as you check your heart rate, how many times you go to the bathroom, uh, how's your sleep, are you waking up rested, do you have a clear focus, you know, no brain fog. These are going to be indicators uh, of our body being in this rest, this very balanced state uh, to handle the stress that we perceive in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, but if our body is not in these specific markers, which I'm sure I can go into if you want, uh, then our body's going to show us these, these symptoms essentially. So I hope that kind of makes sense for your listeners. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like, like we keep saying, people don't realize that their, their body is stressed, that they're producing cortisol. I feel like everyone's constantly being bombarded and constantly on the you know go 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 that they just they just don't realize it and until obviously we have to be experiencing chronic stress until something eventually we experience symptoms and I feel like people just keep saying oh I haven't you know I haven't I slept for five hours and I'm totally fine and I you know I can do whatever I want and, and then eventually the years pass and you realize oh maybe not sleeping for seven to eight hours or you know, nine, whatever, and eating poor diet, processed food is end up impacting you. And I think we have to make changes now while we are young. So in the future, when we get older, we can prevent. <laughs> yeah, happening. exactly. I mean, for me, like I didn't have any symptoms for seven plus years, for almost seven years. And then all of a sudden, they just pop up and that's unfortunately it's tough because as a human we're very stubborn <laughs> and oh i've been doing this same lifestyle for 15 20 years and i don't i don't feel any different i'm okay and then all of a sudden something can pop up and that's where i i encourage anybody that comes to our work is to check your metabolic markers you know is your resting heart rate 75 to 90 beats per minute upon rising in conjunction with uh, temperature around 97.8. Um, if we're not around those markers, then uh, no matter what we think, okay, no matter what we think, if we're not here, that's our body essentially isn't in this balance, in this health state like it should be, like a 10 year old. If you look at a 10 year old, they have energy all day, they sleep great, they have an appetite their resting heart rate is, you know, 75 to 90 and their temperature is, is 97.8 to 98.6, you know, 37 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit or Celsius, excuse me. Um, so yeah, checking those markers, I think is a great, great start because I didn't, I had no idea. No one taught me this until years after learning about the metabolism and, and crashing my metabolism, which I'm sure you've experienced uh, with cold hands and feet and just irritability and you know, if something falls off the counter and it breaks signs that um, our body isn't necessarily healthy, even though we may look healthy on the outside. I look great on the outside, but my, my health on the internal was trash. And that's another um, unfortunate thing, especially in the fitness industry. My business partner and I came out of uh, many people think just because you look good, that's a sign of health. But um, it's, it's not all the time, unfortunately. Mm. 100%. I feel everyone's so fixated on those aesthetic goals of having a six pack and just looking shredded and having, you know, it's just, it's just like people who aren't necessarily in the fitness industry don't realize that they're looking at, they're, these are like fitness goals that they always keep saying, hashtag, hashtag goals. And it's just like, these aren't goals. <laughs> like if people knew the um, symptoms and the side effects that people who are constantly putting their body through this constant stress of becoming a low body fat and dieting and all this constant long hours of, of working out in the gym, then people wouldn't say this is hashtag goals. And I thought there's some people in the fitness industry, some bodybuilders and uh, bikini competitors who do this for like a living are pretty much open about what they go through. And I feel, I feel like there needs to be more people in that kind of industry who speak about it and Raise, a, raise this awareness that this isn't something that, ge that, that general population should aspire to look like and assume that this is, this is um, sustainable and you can always look like someone who has, who's like 
5% body fat, this is not sustainable, this isn't goals. And if you're female, you need to have fat on your body to, you know, and be nourishing your body to have a menstrual cycle, to conceive, and all this kind of stuff. And I feel people don't realize this until it's happened to them. Like, um, yeah, it's, it's not realistic, it's not sustainable. Um, but unfortunately, we, I tend to see most people have to come to this uh, complication or some sort of health issue in their life for them to actually make change. And um, it's sad, but at the same time, as long as you're willing to, to change, you know, where you're at and, and give other things a shot that you haven't tried before, because if you're dealing with any sort of symptom, whether it's a gut issue, a skin issue, an energy issue, what you've been doing isn't going to continue to work. So you have to be, uh, be cognizant of looking at your entire lifestyle and seeing what you've done up until that point that has led up you know, not just the past few months, but what have you done your entire life uh, that could be causing a lot of these issues. And that's where um, we really cover a lot of that in our programs, in our free trigger point guide is, is building these foundational habits that, like I was talking about earlier, that are going to start uh, pulling our body and bringing our body uh, back into this balance, this rest, this digest, this repair state. Uh, because most of the time, most people are stuck in this state and you could be stuck in a stress state for many years and not have any symptoms. Um, the body, and that shows how resilient the body is. The body is made tremendously powerful. And uh, sometimes it just takes, you know, we all have a different lifestyle. We've all had different lifestyles growing up. Yes, we've all, you know, have our physiology is the same, essentially, you know, a little difference in hormones, male, female, but we all pretty much need the same clean water, we need clean air, we need metabolic foods that support our metabolism and help us produce energy. Um, so yeah. So before we move on to how to essentially lower the stress through nutrition, supplements and all this kind of stuff, what are some of these popular lifestyle approaches and diets that people fall into, fall victim to, um, that maybe people need to rethink and be like, okay, this is actually a stressor, despite, you know, you might be doing intimate fasting for X amount of time, but then, you know, it doesn't, it, it's essentially a stressor for the body. And I feel like people don't realize it and they just follow it for so long. And then they're like, oh, what happened? And so what are some of these things that people might not be aware of? Yeah, good, good question. Um, coming out of the, the fitness industry as a bod ex bodybuilder and really focused on the main lifts. Many people do like deadlifts and squats, uh, lunges, all that type of stuff. I'm gonna start with the fitness side, then I'll get into the nutrition. Um, but many of these exercises we see people do in the gym um, are, are very, uh, they don't respect our biology as a human. And as a human, our main movements is to stand, walk, run, and throw. Um, and many exercises you see people do in the gym, like squats, deadlift, bench press, shoulder press, bicep curl, they're stuck in the, what's called sagittal plane. It's, it's a very one dimensional movement. When in reality, as a human, we move when we walk, we move in all planes of, of motion. Um, and many of the exercises that I used to do as a bodybuilder, they isolate a muscle, you know, a bicep curl isolates the bicep, a, a shoulder, press isolates the shoulders or leg extension, the quads. So the body, uh, when, we, when we truly learn how the body's created, it's not meant to isolate a muscle. These muscles are like one big chain. They all, there's multiple different chains or also we call them what's called slings, uh, myofascial slings throughout the whole body. And when we isolate a muscle, that's essentially disconnecting that break. It's breaking the chain of, of your muscles, of your slings. Um, and that's essentially a stress, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's basically short-circuiting your, your body. Just like if I were to short-circuit this computer, um, it wouldn't work right. It wouldn't have a good connection. Same thing, if I isolate a muscle, I short-circuit the software, which is my brain, into the hardware, which is my body, and I'm short-circuiting that. So the style of training that we do um, stems a lot from functional patterns where it's essentially... Uh, integrating, connecting all of these slings, these muscles together as one unit again, just like we and when we were to go run or go throw something. 
you're not just isolating your shoulder when you throw, you're using your whole body when we throw something or when we sprint. So that's as, as far as the fitness side, many, I even had that thought. I thought what I was doing was healthy at the time, but unfortunately it was causing more stress within my physical structure. Just like we can have physical uh, issues with our car, if our car gets hit and it compacts on certain uh, parts of the engine, it may not work right. Same thing with our body. If we don't have a good strong posture, if we're out of alignment, we have a lot of compression in our spine, that's going to affect how our body works um, because posture can affect your stress levels. You know, if you don't have a solid posture and your body's out of alignment, your body can be stuck in a stress state. It could also, it's, it's huge. I mean, we see in a lot of pain, any pain, physical pain we have, most of the time is going to stem from a structural issue. Uh, digestive issues can, can stem from your posture hormonal issues, body fat, sleep, energy, libido, nonverbal communication. I mean, so many different aspects to health are affected by our posture. So I think that's a huge uh, one in the fitness industry that I wasn't personally aware of until I had to deal with many injuries and just was in pain all the time at, at the young age of 24. Um, and then as far as nutrition, uh, many nutritional habits that we may think are healthy. So let's go through many things that are mainstream, whether it's intermittent fasting, whether it's low carb diets, especially in the fitness industry. If someone's doing, you know, they want to cut body fat, they're going to do a low carb diet. Um, the wrong type of proteins we see a lot, uh, which I'll get into. And then of course, just eating fake food, eating a lot of these uh, foods that may fit our macros, but aren't nutritionally dense at all and have no nutrients and we're still just starving ourselves um, because our body needs minerals it needs the right amount of the quality you know anti-inflammatory amino acid proteins and it needs the right type of carbs as well you know fats come come you know more towards the bottom i think focusing on saturated fat and another thing is many people are eating the unsaturated fats um, like the excessive nuts and seeds and soy and legumes, and that can cause a stress response unknowingly. So um, with, with the intermittent fasting and low carb diets, you may feel great. I know I felt great on the first year with intermittent fasting, but like we were talking about earlier with the stress hormones, stress hormones feel good. I mean, you go on a roller coaster, you feel great, but go on that roller coaster 24 seven for a year and then tell me how you feel after, after that year. You may feel good for a certain time, but over time, it's going to take a toll on the body. And I, don't, I think we could get away with intermittent fasting only if we lived in a, a pretty much stress-free environment. But nowadays, it's like you have stresses coming at you at all fronts, you know, environmental stress of bright lights, of EMFs, of you know, crappy quality water. It's just everywhere. So it's just another, another trash piece of trash to the pile that puts us in this stress state. Um, the low carb diets, yes, they may work for a certain time if you want to lose weight. But uh, remember, losing weight is not an indicator of health. We have to look at these metabolic markers like I was talking about, our heart rate, our temperature, you know, our energy levels, our sleep, um, our focus, over the losing weight aspect. And then uh, with the pro with the food, as far as protein, I know personally uh, with myself and I see many others, our clients and people, we just, we eat a lot of these uh, inflammatory rich proteins, which are going to stem from your, you know, your uh, farmed raised pork, your farmed chicken, fatty fish, nuts, seeds, the protein bars. Uh, they're just, they're, they're very inflammatory. And sometimes a lot of these proteins uh, aren't even the strong proteins. You know, there's weak, I don't know if you talk about this with your clients, but weak, medium, and strong proteins. And we want to focus on the strong uh, bioavailable protein that our body can actually utilize, absorb, and, and convert into usable energy. But um, a lot of the proteins, especially in the bodybuilding world, are the chicken, the egg whites, the fatty fish like salmon. Uh, steak isn't so bad, but again, sourcing is also important. Uh, and we're avoiding a lot of these 
anti-inflammatory rich proteins. Like, you know, my whole life, I never had gelatin. I never, I mean, I ate eggs, but they weren't pastured eggs from a local farm. The egg yolks are very important. You know, grass fed, raw dairy, I think is awesome. Even pasteurized is okay if you source it properly. Um, some people, it, it may not work well, but low fat white fish, I think is another great source of protein. And for, for your listeners, if you haven't focused on these anti-inflammatory proteins, simply just adding more of these in uh, to your diet can make such a, big, such a big difference in pulling your body out of this stress state of giving your body protein um, that it can utilize because um, you know, we need protein for many things like hormone production and digestion and uh, sleep and our liver needs protein, the right type of protein. So yeah, the protein aspect, I think is a huge, huge thing uh, to, to focus on just simply swapping. And that's what we again talk about uh, in our programs is eating more of these anti-inflammatory amino acids, gelatin, uh, like I talked about collagen, grass-fed dairy, egg yolks, um, low fat white fish, organ meats as well as an, as an amazing source of protein and fat soluble vitamins. And then just avoiding these, these other stress causing foods, um, the fake foods, the cereals, the bagels, the breads, the pastas, um, eating out in general is just going to contain a lot of this polyunsaturated fat and a lot of extra fortified iron, which when we eat unsaturated fats and iron together, it's just a recipe for disaster. Um, it creates something what's called lipofuscin and, uh, Lipofuscin is, you can find lipofuscin in so many different diseases and chronic conditions. Um, I know, you know, that's all I ate my whole life. I, my dad was in the food industry, so I had pastries at the house. I had cookies, I had cakes, I had breads, cereals, oatmeal, you name it. It's, it's just essentially fake food that, uh, that just slows down our metabolism, that pushes our body into this stress state and I think educating, continuing to educate ourselves on what, what foods are going to create this stress response and what foods are going to create this anti-stress response and just outweighing them, continuing to outweigh uh, and putting your focus on, on those anti-stressful foods is going to continue to set yourself up for success and you'll feel better. It's, it's hard to change, but um, the education part is huge first because if we don't have any education on what foods are going to create stress or we're just looking at mainstream Google, we're going to be stuck and frustrated for a while. Um, so yeah, that's where we've really gone into this because we tried all these other foods and didn't see any sustainable results until we went back to the stress aspect of focusing on foods that didn't create a stress response. And, you know, it was pretty much that simple. Mm. Definitely. I think we often overcomplicate what food should look like rather than we should just be focusing on going back to basics of, you know, eating whole foods, foods that are minimally processed and contain, you know, vitamins, minerals, all that good yeah. stuff to really nourish the body, support hormonal production. Um, Another thing I wanted to add real quick is, I didn't talk about, is the ingredients, which I'm sure you, you talk about a lot, is just looking at your ingredient label and trying to focus on food that really doesn't have an ingredient label. Um, that's, it seems so simple, but we, we just focus on the macros, you know, oh, protein, carbs, fats. Okay, I'm good. But no, let's look at the ingredients and, and see how many different ingredients are in there. Because most people, uh, unfortunately, are eating foods with 10, 20, 30 plus ingredients. And just getting foods with one ingredient, you know, fresh fruit doesn't have an ingredient label. Dairy, it's one ingredient more, most of the time. Um, so yeah, I think that's another good focal point. So I just want to mention that. Definitely, because I think if you can't pronounce an ingredient on a, on a packaging, then you probably shouldn't get it. So I wanted to touch on, because we've been touching on um, the importance of making sure you're drinking the healthiest water that doesn't contain chemicals and all that kind of stuff. Would you recommend the filtering kind of um, product that you get that filter the water or is there a specific other approach? Because obviously, People, I think we're getting onto the fact that drinking from plastic water bottles and drinking from tap water, I think people have understood that this isn't healthy, but how, do, how does someone avoid these chemicals in their water? 
Yeah, good, good question. Um, even though I still see many people drink out of plastics and still drink tap water. Um, there's a, I mean, a skeptic, in my opinion, is always going to be a skeptic, no matter how much proof and facts you show them. We have multiple blog posts uh, on our website that go into detail of learning about the quality of your water, because it is the quality over your quantity, uh, especially in the fitness industry. I used to drink a gallon to two gallons of water a day, and it's way too much. Um, but as far as the quality of your water, wherever you're at, you can, you can always continue to upgrade. And uh, even if you're drinking tap water now or bottled water or some Brita or some filtered water, looking at you know, getting yourself more towards the reverse, I would say reverse osmosis or distilled is the best too, in my opinion. Um, if you don't have the funds to invest into a filtration system, we recommend uh, our clients look for a local health food store around their area where they can go fill up uh, like a BPA free jug or glass, big two gallon, like gallon glass jars and fill up with reverse osmosis or distilled water. Um, and if you ever want to check the water, you could use what's called a TDS meter, total dissolved solids meter to see, you know, how many parts per million are in your water. Ideally less than 50 is what you want to shoot for. Um, but if you have the funds, I, I would say to invest into a water filtration system, then looking for like a reverse osmosis or a distiller uh, would be ideal. We have a few we recommend on our website. I'm not too keen on specifics, as long as it's getting most of the stuff out of the water, you know, the radiation, the viruses, uh, the acids, the, you know, the contaminants, all the other chemicals, the pharmaceuticals, you're going to be fine. There's no need to stress really about that. And if you're traveling, I mean, with me, if I travel somewhere, I bring my own water because I really take care of my water. You know, we, we make our own magnesium bicarbonate supplement. So I, I take very high value in my water. Um, but going out, I mean, don't stress about it. Do the best you can. Look for glass. Look for water bottles that don't have other ingredients. Um, and not only with drinking water, but focusing on liquids that have hydration plus nutrients like I'm doing now, orange juice, you know, I'm getting hydration plus I'm getting sugar and I put some whole food vitamin C in there because at the end of the day, uh, our body, yes, it can make its own water, uh, through proper mitochondrial respiration, but, um, most people can't retain the water and they're not getting water throughout their whole entire body. So that's why we do trigger pointing a lot, which I'm sure we'll get into, but doing stuff like bone broth is another good source of nutrients and hydration together. Milk is also another uh, big nutrient and hydration combo. And then depending, it, the quantity is really gonna depend, I think on your activity level and how much you sweat. If you're someone who's outdoors all day, yeah, you probably need to drink two to three liters of actual water. But someone for someone who's indoors, not really sweating, you know, more than a liter to two liter, I think could be too much. And that's where, if you want to check for yourself, if you're drinking too much liquids, is if you're going to the bathroom more than four to five times, that's usually a sign that you're over drinking water and your body's not holding on to it. You're just flushing it out, which can put extra stress on your kidneys and create more electrolyte imbalances. So that's another thing we want to be aware of if as far as water and liquid content in general. Um, and then there's, you know, you could add trace minerals to your water to get those trace minerals. Um, everyone has their different opinion. I like uh, to take she legit and then I do uh, whole food vitamin C. Uh, it's like a powder that I put into my water as well that has salt uh, and some whole food vitamin C. I don't know if you've looked in it. It's like the adrenal cocktail. Um, mm -hmm. which is especially because, you know, I, I sweat a lot. So I try to replenish a lot of liquids that way to get the nutrients and the water in at the same time. But yeah, to trying to avoid all plastics with your water. I mean, especially if it's the issue is where your plastics is in heat um, for a long time and the xenoestrogens can leach into the water. And then if you drink those xenoestrogens, that's going to disrupt your hormones and that's going to slow down your metabolism and that's going to create more stress internally and just simply push your body 
getting into this stress state. Mm, definitely. And I think it's, I'm glad you kind of touched on how you should only be going to the toilet four to five times a day to kind of pee. Because I think a lot of the time people think, oh, if I'm peeing a lot, then that's a good sign that my body is, you know, getting rid of the water. I'm glad you touched on that because I feel like it's, it's the opposite kind of, you don't want to be going to the toilet so much. Yeah, yeah, that's another misconception, I think, is, and going to the bathroom in the middle of the night is also a sign that you're either drinking too much or your body's metabolism is slowed down. So, yeah, something to definitely be aware of. So, let's kind of, I think we've touched on some of the biggest kind of factors that can cause stress in the body and how it affects the body. So, what, what ways, we've been kind of like touching on trigger points and but. What are some of these ways, habits and ways that you can eliminate stress? So what are some of these um, foods that are anti-stress and promote, you know, um, reducing the stress? And you mentioned yeah. some supplements as well. So I guess we can just delve into some of these things. Sure. Yeah. So where we start really and where we recommend people uh, to look at is our trigger point guide um, because Trigger pointing is one of the most important things we can do for our, the physical body to get our body out of this stress state. Um, trigger pointing is essentially doing your own deep tissue massage by using different tools like lacrosse balls or a theracane or soft balls, foam rollers, PVC pipes, etc., to physically push into your body, whether it's your, your chest, whether it's your stomach, your legs, and this is where we cover in our trigger point guide of this, the different areas of your body to begin to trigger point. Because when we feel pain, when we trigger point, which I'm sure if you've ever had a massage and you feel pain when they apply pressure, that is stress. That's stress that's building up in your body. And if you don't physically remove it, then it's constantly going to be putting your body into a stress state, even though you don't feel the pain until you apply pressure. That's the tricky part is um, that pain that you feel is constantly depleting your body of minerals as well as blocking absorption of new nutrients and uh, a dirty pan with. You have to squeeze out that sponge to get all the crud out. Same thing what you're doing when you trigger point, you're squeezing out all that crud and when you let go of that sponge in some clean water. It can rehydrate and re-soak up in oxygen. So trigger pointing is a very, very important piece uh, into not only hydrating our body, but getting our body out of this stress state. And unfortunately, with all the years of in the fitness industry and therapies Nick and I have done, dry needling, chiropractic adjustments, stretching, um, these mobility exercises, they unfortunately do not do justice like trigger pointing does. Um, you may see some short-term relief, but they're not going to get your body out of the stress state like these, uh, like these other therapies would claim to do. Um, as far as nutrition, uh, building foundational food habits to again supporting our liver are what we focus on so uh, four main habits that we talk about in our programs and on our trigger point guide is to eat within 30 to 60 minutes of waking up and then when we eat we want to focus on combining carbs and proteins together because if we eat a carbohydrate by itself it's going to elevate our blood sugar. And if we eat a protein by itself, that's going to drop our blood sugar. And we want to keep our blood sugar relatively stable throughout the day. So when we eat a carbon protein together, it helps balance out that blood sugar, which if our blood sugar rises or drops, our body needs to release stress hormones to get back into that balanced state, which I'm sure you know. And then making sure we're getting enough protein throughout the day. Uh, especially those anti-inflammatory amino acid proteins. Uh, we recommend, you know, 80 to 100 grams for females. Again, depending on weight, it's going to matter. 
stress levels. And then males, you know, 120, 100 to 120. Um, those are like more the minimum requirements of protein. And then number four is focusing on saturated fat and avoiding unsaturated fat, which is another misconception, especially in America, is the saturated fat is unhealthy and the unsaturated fat is healthy, but um, it's, it's quite the opposite when you look at how these fats uh, biochemically react within the body. You know, a saturated fat creates an anti-stress response and a unsaturated fat creates a stress response. So knowing what is an unsaturated fat and what is a saturated fat. So your saturated fats are going to include your, you know, your pastured egg yolks, your coconut oil, your duck fat, your tallow, your ghee, your butter, uh, things of that nature. And then your unsaturated fats, what we want to avoid are what's going to cause that stress response, you know, are the vegetable oils, the nuts, the seeds, the legumes, the beans, the soy, um, just all the fake foods. So those are, you know, foundational food habits that, that we focus on. And then we give, you know, our, our clients and friends, and whoever wants to know more in all of our YouTube videos, the proper, the anti-stressful carbs, proteins, and fats, and your anti-stressful carbs are going to be, you know, your, your, your raw honey, your maple syrup, which are amazing. You have all your fresh fruits, anything from melons, berries, to citrus fruits, um, especially in the summertime, you know, it's very important because they're in season. Uh, you have your fruit juices, you have uh, roots like potatoes, sweet potatoes, squash, beets. Um, I don't do so personally recommend so much grains. You know, I think wild rice is a better option than white rice because um, it can cause still a little bit of in inflammation within the digestive tract. And then breads, we always recommend sourdough bread um, are our top carbohydrate sources. Proteins I kind of went over. And your protein is, is most of the time going to contain a fat in it already. Um, the, the dairy for sure, the shellfish a little bit. Um, the white fish, not so much. So if you're trying to keep your, your fat intake a little lower, your low fat white fish, you know, rockfish, orange roughy, um, flounder, halibut, haddock, I think are great options if you want to keep that fat a little bit lower. Mm, interesting. And so, I'm, yeah. I'm going to include the, your triple fencing guide in the show notes. So uh, there's one thing I, I know is becoming quite of a it's being spoke about a lot more on social media and people are obviously confused about it, but it's the whole fact that eating nuts and seeds and salmon, but everyone's so confused about this because obviously when you're searching Google, all the studies show that, you know, it can help reduce inflammation. It does this, it does that. Just to kind of like give your kind of stance and to touch on it, just because you've kind of been speaking about it in the episode in the interview. Um, can you like speak a bit about how the pufas are not exactly what we thought they were like healthy. Yeah. Yeah. We've written uh, quite a few blog posts on uh, the detrimental effects of omega threes and omega sixes also known as polyunsaturated fats. Um, it's, it's just that from my perspective, I ate polyunsaturated fats my whole entire life with every single meal. Um, 30, 40, 50, probably 100 grams a day, some days. And we really only need a few grams of polyunsaturated fats. Um, and when we look at, you know, like a, like a salmon or a, or a fish that's more of a fatty, fish, essentially uh, bad, but it's just we've ingested too many polyunsaturated fats our whole life. And, and it's very important to keep that gram of polyunsaturated fat intake low as possible because you're going to get, like I said, enough through your eggs or dairy. And if you want to have your salmon, you know, once or twice a month, fine, have it because um, the, you're going to get, yes, some trace minerals out of the salmon that will help negate the, the detrimental effects of the polyunsaturated fats. So it's just we've, in my perspective, we've overdone it with the omega-3s and omega-6s. Even if we think they're healthy, they're not because um, that myth was pushed back in the 40s, excuse me, 1929, George and Mildred Burr uh, touted that these deficiencies, these issues, these chronic diseases people were having 
they, they thought it was from omega-3 and omega-6 deficiency. But it wasn't until the 40s that nutritionists found these issues they were dealing with was actually you know, B vitamin deficiency, selenium, zinc, and bioavailable copper deficiency. It wasn't, a, in a sense, the PUFA deficiency. Um, so they kind of ran with that, and that's just been told to us through mainstream media that unsatur unsaturated fats are, are healthy because it was, again, it, you have to follow the money. Um, it's, it's a big business in that industry. I took, used to take fish oils all the time, and um, just they just have a very suppressive effect to the thyroid, to the metabolism. They block your liver from being able to, to detoxify estrogen and also convert thyroid hormone, you know, T4 into T3. So we need that to produce energy. Um, so when you look at the biochemical processes of what polyunsaturated fats do when they enter in the body, uh, you start to see that you don't want something that's breaking down into a toxic byproduct like acrolein or aldehyde inside your body. That's just my perspective. You guys can eat whatever you want. Um, but it's just from you know doing that research and understanding the acrolein and aldehyde, which are toxic byproducts of polyunsaturated fats, are the same thing found in car exhaust, same thing found in off-gassing of car smells and new carpet. So um, if you want that in your body, then I guess eat a lot of it. But uh, I don't want to, you know, our bodies are already, like I said, getting bombarded with all these stresses and other toxins from foods and, and clothes and detergents and water and whatever. I mean, the list goes on. EMFs, it's just, we're already bombarded. So uh, it's not that we're, I guess you and me, we're not like health fanatics or health freaks. We just, we just see that we've been bombarded with this stress and we're just trying to survive in this uh, stress created unnatural world that we're living in and just trying to give our body the best chance it can do to produce energy and to, to take care of our temple essentially. Mm, yeah. I think, like you said, I feel like people need to find a way of eating that kind of works for them. And if it, if this way of eating is working and it's sustainable and they're kind of seeing improvements, then then that's fine. But I feel like it's important to know these, know the misconceptions and the myths and just the thing around nutrition so people can make better decisions and not just feel like they read something and it's kind of like, this is how the way we should be eating, everyone should be eating this because a study said that and that we have to conform to it basically. So I think it's good to know all sides of the story, I guess. Um, yeah, I was I was talking to a, to a friend the other day and it's like, yeah, it's so easy to go to Google and do some, you know, even an hour or two of research and think that you know all about nutrition. You know, that's what we tend to do as humans, but I'm not saying I know, I'm still learning, but ever since I got sick that second time, I haven't gone a day without researching and experimenting and doing it with clients. So, so you have to look at, okay, even if someone isn't a doctor, I've experimented with so many different diets and I've researched every single day and I, you know, listen to so many different people and you kind of have to come up with your own conclusions and experiment. I think experimenting is, is the best form of your own research not just reading a study that you see online, but actually putting it to the test, giving it, giving it a, a reliable uh, shot, you know, and going into it with an open mind um, and then checking your metabolic markers, you know, going back to using those feedback mechanisms to see if that food is supporting your body, supporting health or not supporting health. I think that's one of the best ways to stay less dogmatic and to stay less attached to a diet or a study. Um, so, yeah. I agree with what you said I think that was a great great piece of advice and let's kind of touch on trigger pointing and mm -hmm. that kind of aspect so how often you would probably mention it in the guide you have but how often does some should someone do trigger pointing yeah good question um, if you're brand new to trigger pointing uh, first we have again videos on that trigger point guide and educate a lot of education in our blog post is is to learn, is to read about it, um, is to understand what it's doing. Because trigger pointing is very painful, especially if you're new to it or you've had a lot of stress unknowingly built up in your life or knowingly, that stress is gonna hold on to in, into your muscle and fascia. Fascia is essentially just another word for muscle. The fascia 
uh, is like this 3D webbing that goes all throughout our body, our organs, our joints, everywhere. And uh, if you're just starting out, we have two to three different trigger points throughout the body to do daily. And you need to have specific pieces of tools to do trigger pointing uh, because different tools are needed for different parts of the body. Mm -hmm. um, and doing at least two to three, you know, like we have set in our trigger point guide a day, um, we recommend starting, even if you only have time for one, being consistent with trigger pointing and doing it properly are gonna be the two most important uh, focal points is doing it consistently every day and the quality of how you trigger points is another aspect. You can, you could, I could have someone uh, apply pressure here for five minutes, but if I'm, if I'm tensed up and I'm not relaxing and I'm not breathing properly and I'm not in a relaxed environment when I do trigger pointing, it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So being relaxed when you do it and really understanding, uh, finding that pain threshold, you know, we talk about in the videos, you want to hit this pain threshold to where you're just about to like tense up, you know, that tense feeling and stopping right before that, but still feeling some sort of dull, achy sensation um, is the goal. And to continue to get deeper into these uh, layers, because there's so many layers in the fascia and in the muscle. So sometimes it takes five to 10 minutes just on one side, um, depending on what's going on with the individual. But yeah, if you could ideally 30 to 60 minutes a day, um, if you have that time, is, is highly recommended because the, the more you can remove this stress, the knots, the adhesions, uh, the more hydration you're going to get throughout the body, the better blood flow, and the quicker you're going to get your body out of this stressed state. And trigger pointing is the first step. You know, it's not the fix all. It's not the magic pill. It's the first step to rebuilding your posture to restructuring your body you know when i first started a trigger point i did it an hour a day for six months straight and now with a lot of i've been doing uh you know this postural training for just about three years now um, i don't really do trigger point too much if i go on a long drive or if i'm stressed uh, i probably do it a couple times a week because we do corrective exercises i've done a lot of corrective exercises and movements to to recode my body into these proper positions. So I, I don't hold this stress like I used to. Um, so my body's more resilient to stress, if that makes sense. Mm, definitely. So with, I wanted to touch on one thing that I made a note and I forgot to cover. Sure. Obviously, you know, we're talking about how eating within 30, 30 minutes to an hour of waking up, what would, because I know I get, I get this a lot of time, what if someone is just not hungry and they just can't eat breakfast and they just always skip it? What, what's your kind of response to someone who's said that statement? Yeah, that's, that's tough. Um, it really, I mean, however long they're waiting to eat, just continue to try to, to push it, you know, at least 30 minutes earlier than what you did before. So if someone wakes up at six and they're not eating till nine, at least try to get it by 8, 8.30 instead of 9. Mm -hmm. And then even if you're not hungry, having something small. Sometimes I only have a few uh, spoonfuls of cottage cheese and some honey, and then I'm out the door or something. You know, I have, I have something to take care of. So getting something small, protein and carb, of course, and then continuing to try to push that time closer and closer to when you wake up, as well as doing all these other habits that we've talked about. And I talk about, again, a lot of stuff in that trigger point guide that we incorporate that's going to help assist the body to increase the metabolism, to want to have that appetite, to want to be hungry in the morning. Um, so two foundational things you could do, like I said, try to eat 30 minutes prior to what you've been doing. If you're waiting till 10 a.m., 11 a.m., try to push it back a little and then always get something small no matter what even if you're not hungry get something in the system and that's going to help jump start your metabolism as well as doing all these other anti-stressful habits to give your body that appetite that it that it should be having mm, all right that's that's a good piece of advice 
And for in with regards to supplements, I feel like everyone's always wants to know about supplements. What are there any, I don't know, top supplements that you think are necessary that we maybe lack or are just very deficient in and we need them to fight the stress, like reduce the stress? Yeah, another great question. Uh, because some people, you know, they're either for supplements or they're completely against it. Um, I personally, and what we talk about in our business is building foundational food habits first, like we talked about earlier. And simultaneously, you know, if that person feels comfortable, uh, we always recommend magnesium, some sort of magnesium supplement, ideally the bicarbonate form. Uh, the chloride form is, is a second option. We recommend bath flakes uh, in, in the form of chloride because magnesium is going to be the first mineral to leave the body under a stressful response or a reaction. And as we know, magnesium controls 42% of how our body functions. So magnesium is going to be up there. And it's not a supplement, essentially. We have to look at it as okay, magnesium is a mineral. And our body is made up of minerals. So we're just supporting our body of what it actually needs to function optimally. Um, magnesium, ideally number one. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really the, the main one. Uh, from there, she legit is also a great one. I don't, I mean, if we all need minerals, of course, and making sure you're sourcing she legit properly, I think is another great option because it can just continue to provide your body with those minerals that you may not have the, uh, giving yourself from food or from good quality food your whole life because most of us have eaten fake food our whole life and have been devoid of nutrients. So she legit is, is just compressed uh, plant matter that has all these trace bonded uh, organic minerals. Um, and then from there, I mean, again, these aren't like priority, but it all depends on the individual. I think digestive enzymes can be uh, very uh, important to help assist the body, especially if it's in a stress state, to just help kind of support the digestion and, and the absorption and utilization of, of nutrients and food that we eat. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, it's going to depend on the individual vitamin E, vitamin K I can get into, but um, I, I don't want to recommend it, you know, immediately for someone until they build a foundation and then still see you know, if, if they're not getting enough fat soluble vitamins from their food. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm big, I'm very big into uh, electrolyte salts, you know, getting enough potassium, getting enough sodium, getting enough magnesium, those potassium, uh, those electrolyte salts, like, you know, your coconut water, your potatoes, bananas, fresh juice, fresh fruits, uh, salting food to taste, and just listening to your body, drink when you're thirsty, you know, really sticking to these intuitive feedback mechanisms and not just getting so nitty gritty with the numbers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I feel like we, people need to go back to like the intuitive eating kind of way of living that we used to follow and do when we were growing up. I feel like everyone's so fixated with, like you said, the macros, the calories, all the numbers and not listening to the body, what the body is telling them and just respecting what, the body's asking for um so yeah definitely having to go back to those key signs and cues that the body's given is super important when trying to go back to hormonal balance yeah. and managing that stress so i think we touch on tons of great information some really valuable stuff that our listeners can do literally now <laughs> after listening to this um interview so what would be, I guess, that yep. final piece of advice, that take-home message? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think just being, uh, continuing to educate yourself on, on what is going to support human physiology and what isn't, because uh, it can, like I said earlier in the video, it, we can get so caught up in having our blinders on. Um, so focusing on what's going to support human physiology, what's going to cause a stress response, what is it going to cause, what's going to cause an anti-stress response, you know, what's going to give our body energy and uh, just being open-minded to, to everything. And yes, this, if you're dealing with any health issues, I mean, I still deal with some things every now and then, you know, it's, it's going to happen. We're not, we're not perfect. We, we can't know everything. 
Um, so it's okay to be confused and frustrated. You know, that's part of the learning process, but continuing to adapt and be open-minded and just willing to change, I think are, are some good key attributes to, to have. Mm. Yeah, I think it's when you're on this kind of journey of improving health, I think we need to don't expect things to be perfect. Don't try for that perfection that, you know, I'm going to eat super clean every single day and not, you know, there's always going to be the time where you might not eat the best way that you wanted to eat or you might get a little bit stressed at one point, but you can't live a life or you can't live in a bubble. Like nothing's going to be perfect, but you just have to use these habits make sure that you're able to control it, manage it better than you would have done, prevent it causing problems from the, down the line, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Doing, doing the best, I guess, you can do with the resources that you have and the knowledge that you have. Yeah. Exactly. So how can our listeners connect with you? Where can they find you? Yeah, they can uh, find our main website. It's mitigatestress.com. Um, that has pretty much everything, uh, our blog posts. We have many free blog posts. We have a shop page with our top re recommended products. We have our magnesium page um, where we have a magnesium bicarbonate product. And then our training tab of our website where we offer a one-time investment program that focuses on a lot of these foundational habits. It's called the foundational fitness program. How to focus on rebuilding your posture and nutritional habits and other lifestyle habits to do pretty much everything we've talked about, bring your body out of this stress state and focusing on things to support health. And uh, on Instagram, it's Kelowna underscore fitness. That's my personal account. And my business partners are, you know, videos. And we also have YouTube channels uh, as well. We post more longer videos there. So uh, that's mitigate stress dot com and mitigate stress 2.0 those links are uh can be found on our Instagram. awesome i'll have everything linked in the show notes highly recommend all of our all of our listeners check out mitigatestress.com follow both your personal instagram account and the mitigate stress instagram um, the youtube channel is full of tons of great valuable and evidence-based information that's just super literally you and your business card break the information down super easy you know you have your, your great whiteboard um video <laughs> breaking down stuff really just so people can understand it and yeah, uh, yeah highly recommend subscribing but thank you so much for taking the time of your day to come on the podcast and speak about all this yeah. amazing and awesome stuff i'm sure our listeners have learned, learned a lot from the episode and from you and yeah thank you so much I hope so too. Thank you for having me on. I, I really appreciate it and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day and thank you all for tuning in.